Hello, everyone. My name is Ben Thompson, and welcome back to the Tinnitus Relief Podcast. I'm joined today by Professor Peter McNaughton, who is going to discuss some important parallels between pain, tinnitus, his research, and some unique perspectives on the root cause of tinnitus. As we know, there's not just one type of tinnitus, so this conversation will go into some details and talk about some different scientific theories and perspectives on how we can better understand this condition. Professor Peter McNaughton's lab group is based in the UK, and they look at age-related diseases, investigating cellular and molecular basis of sensations. He is a fellow of the Academy of Medical Sciences and previously was head of the Department of Pharmacology at the University of Cambridge. He has published extensively in Nature, Science, Neuron, Neuroscience, and the Journal of Physiology, amongst others. So Peter, welcome. Let's go straight into it. What are your unique takes on the relationship between managing pain as well as managing tinnitus? Well, I, I should be upfront and say that I'm not really a tinnitus person. Um, I've worked most of my scientific life on pain, and I've always been curious about tinnitus, and I've wondered whether some of the ideas might be transferred from pain into tinnitus. I'm certainly not the first person to have this idea. A lot of people have drawn parallels between neuropathic pain, which is a, a very unpleasant and long-lasting form of pain that bedevils many people, um, and, and drawing parallels between uh, pain and tinnitus, which in a similar way is a very disturbing and upsetting condition, uh, which uh, it, it begins with, with some sort of peripheral insult, like a loud sound. Neuropathic pain begins often with an injury, um, and which lasts for a very long time. So I think at least superficially, there are some parallels between pain and tinnitus. And talk to us about how you first made this connection and some of the insights that came across when you were considering the similarities and go back to those early moments when you made this connection and what were the kind of insights that you thought could have could be helpful to those with tinnitus that you knew from your work with pain? Mm -hmm. Well, let me talk a little bit about pain first. Um, so I, I often say to my students, if you want to do an experiment on, on pain, uh, all you need is a brick and your toe. Drop the, the brick on your toe and you will undoubtedly feel pain. So pain, nobody doubts this. Pain is initiated in the peripheral nervous system by a damaging insult of one sort or another, such as the brick. Now, what happens with your brick is that a, a day or so later, your toe will be uh, swollen, uh, red and throbbing, and you will still feel pain. So there's been a transition from the initial insult to release of inflammatory mediators. Uh, so the brick is no longer there, obviously, no longer having its effect. But the inflammation, the inflammatory mediators cause a continuing sensation of pain. So we're all familiar with this. And many of us are also familiar with uh, neuropathic pain, uh, things that cause damage to the peripheral nervous system. Maybe you've been uh, unlucky enough to have the uh, uh, brick fall in a particularly unpleasant part of your peripheral nervous system. And it, it can become chronic pain uh, lasting for many months, years, etc. And th there's a, a subset of chronic pain uh, which is called neuropathic pain. And that's thought to be due to damage of the peripheral nervous system. Now, in the pain field, there's been a lot of dispute about where neuropathic pain actually originates from. Now, just to go back to my original analogy about the brick, uh, nobody doubts that the brick has caused painful sensation by uh, damaging or, or interacting with your peripheral nervous system. But months later, the uh, injury caused by the brick typically will have healed up, yet people are completely, you can't see anything wrong at all, yet people sometimes continue to report pain for many months or even years after the initial insult. And, and this is typical of neuropathic pain. So the question arises, where is the pain being produced in neuropathic pain? And since the uh, initial insult seems to have disappeared, the initial damage, 
uh, it's been widely assumed without really very much evidence that somehow the pain has migrated from the initial site, the toe, uh, into the uh, central nervous system. So there is a, an, in quotes, pain memory, which is stored uh, and where it's stored is not clear, but uh, people think it may be in the spinal cord or, or perhaps up in the cortex. So this view that, that neuropathic pain is essentially a central nervous system problem has been very influential in the field. Now, I'm not saying it's completely wrong. Uh, there are forms of pain that can be precipitate, precipitated by strokes, for instance, which clearly is damage to the central nervous system. But common or garden neuropathic pain is increasingly people are coming around to the view that this is probably due to ongoing input from the peripheral nervous system. Now, you, you may ask, okay, so what? <laughs> What's the point in arguing about this? Well, it depends a lot on the treatment, because if you're convinced that pain is in the neuropathic pain is in the central nervous system, then you're going to want a drug which penetrates the central nervous system, such as morphine or whatever, which, by the way, is, is uh, uh, typically very ineffective for neuropathic pain. You're going to want a drug which penetrates the nervous system and does something to, to your brain or your spinal cord. Well, if you think that neuropathic pain remains peripheral, then you're in much easier territory because you can use a peripherally restricted drug, which does not affect the nervous system, doesn't have any psychotropic effects and things like that. Uh, and maybe that would have a chance of suppressing the pain. So there's been this sort of uh, movement in the field from a view of central towards a view of peripheral hmm. now we and, have much and how has the, how has that evolved over time that from these initial observations studies connections you've made how have you seen perhaps the complexity of the knowledge on pain evolve uh, amongst you and other researchers uh, yes it, it's 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 almost a simplification in a way uh, because what we're saying is that whatever caused the pain in the first place uh, is also ca causing the long-term pain. So it's a simpler view of the world, but it does overturn a, a long-held view that chronic long-term conditions such as neuropathic pain were likely to be central in their origin. So I, I probably said enough about pain, but I, I did wonder, just in my own mind, uh, whether the same thing might not be true of tinnitus. So it's a very similar scenario, actually. Everybody knows that tinnitus is precipitated by a loud sound, which causes temporary or, or often long-lasting deafness, hardly a surprise. Uh, so it used to be called boilermaker's disease because people that were inside boilers banging the rust of tinnitus uh, exposure to damaging levels of statues of was marble, and, and this caused him to, to have uh, He said, I am troubled greatly by a cricket in one ear and a spider's web in the other. The cricket, which was his tinnitus, and in the other ear, the spider's web, which meant that he couldn't hear so well. So the question was, uh, like pain, could we think of tinnitus in terms of not only a, an immediate uh, peripheral interaction with the auditory system in your actual ear, uh, but also whether long term that could be the same explanation. This is a short interruption from today's video to announce the tinnitus quiz. If you're watching this video, there's a good chance that you or someone you know has tinnitus. We know how much tinnitus can impact your daily life and we're here to help. Visit tinnitusquiz.com and take a two-minute quiz to receive personalized treatment plans that have helped hundreds of people learn to manage their tinnitus. Start now at tinnitusquiz.com. Now, this is a view that ha has no uh, credibility almost whatsoever within the auditory field. People take it for granted that tinnitus will be a phenomenon of the CNS. And um, so one of the things that I've started doing recently is working with a, a well-known auditory group up in Nottingham. This is Alan Palmer's group. And we've been looking at the idea that maybe tinnitus, like neuropathic pain, is a peripheral uh, condition. 
And if it is, then it will be much easier to treat because drugs that don't invade the central nervous system won't have effects on other functions of the central nervous system, such as consciousness, cognition, et cetera, which is always mm -hmm. a big problem. Yeah, let me comment on that. As an audiologist going through various years of specialty, one of my mentors was Dr. and still is Dr. Powell Jastroboff and founder of Tinnitus Retraining Therapy. That model, the, the neurophysiological model of tinnitus, I would say gives a lot of credit or attribution to the source of tinnitus as coming from the cochlea, coming from the ear. So everyone has this small organ inside of the ear that we call the inner ear. That's the cochlea. Inside of that cochlea, there are these small little hair cells. And what we know with very specific testing, ultra high frequency audiometry, autoacoustic emissions, tests that audiologists can perform in a clinic, we can find changes to the hearing system that a normal hearing test may not find. So I think a logical question for us to ask is if tinnitus is mostly caused from the ear, then what about patients who get a test and it shows normal hearing? So that's a fairly standard and somewhat limited hearing test. So we see a lot of patients uh, in our practice who have hearing tests in the normal range. And for mm -hmm. those individuals, they don't think this is caused from the ear because the doctor just gave them the pass of no, the ears are fine. Mm -hmm. But a more specific audiology test can find that these high pitch cells, these uh, stereo cilia, these hair cells aren't performing what they used to be. Mm -hmm. And the ultra high pitch hearing isn't what it used to be. And that's quite logical to think that, okay, over decades of life, that my hearing probably isn't what it used to be that change, that difference, that delta in the tinnitus retraining therapy, neurophysiological model can manifest as intense, louder tinnitus due to neurological you know, magnification of that source. So talk to me a bit about your theories and other points you have on that, on that subject. Hey, well, it's, it's reassuring to hear that. And yes, I, I agree. People that suffer from tinnitus often have at least overtly normal hearing uh, or at least they don't suffer any big hearing loss and uh, but still you can, it's nice to know that you can pick up fine differences that may be the pointers well I, i've drawn an analogy between pain a, and the auditory system but i i have to say that uh, i should make it pretty clear that they obviously are very different and they're different in one important respect uh, well in many important respects but one that springs to mind is that your pain sensitive nerve fibers if i mean as i sit here i feel no pain whatsoever and that corresponds to my all of the millions of nociceptive in other words uh, uh, receptors for noxious stimuli the nociceptive nerve fibers being quiet they're sitting there doing nothing signaling no pain and uh, the auditory system is completely different because the uh, hair cells produce a continuous barrage of action potentials in the second order auditory uh, second order cells of the spiral ganglion. So it, it, it's a very different system. The auditory system is constantly active brrr, all the time, and um, uh, sound is detected by modulation, rather like a sort of radio signal that's being modulated up and down. So that gives you your sensation of hearing. So we definitely, I'm not seeing, being so naive as to say that these are the same system. They are certainly not. Well, so I'd like to comment for a moment just on the on the validity of your perspective here, which is that many times individuals who have bothersome tinnitus, when we test hearing, it shows a change to the hearing. That hearing difference, that either progressive hearing loss, noise-induced hearing loss, whatever the cause may be, that's enough to create tinnitus. So mm -hmm. that tinnitus is definitely going through the neurological system as it has to be perceived because it's going through the nerve, right? And I want to just educate our, our viewers and listeners that it's very common to have hearing loss when you have some tinnitus. And even if your hearing test is in the normal range, more specific testing can show, hey, your ears have changed some. Your ears mm -hmm. are not completely untouched, normal, same as they were when you were 20 years old. And I think right. that point is, is very valid and necessary for us to understand. Yeah. 
Well, I, I just want to, to move on to, to tell you about a, an advance that was made in my lab in the pain field that we're now trying to apply to the uh, tinnitus field. And we've identified a particular protein, a, a molecule, a single molecule, which drives neuropathic pain. I don't want to get too sort of jargon dense here, but this is called, I'll just call it HCN2, because this is the name that, that's been for complicated reasons given to it. So this is a protein which allows current to flow across the membrane of pain-sensitive nerve fibers. And if current is allowed to flow, that makes the interior of the nerve fibers more positive and causes ongoing firing. Now for the nervous system, for the pain-sensitive part of the nervous system, that signals a sensation of pain. We think that an overactivity of this particular ion channel underlies neuropathic pain, not just that we think we've got lots of evidence to show that. So how does this apply to the auditory system? Well, when I became interested in this, we, we looked uh, to see whether this particular ion channel is present in neurons, the spiral ganglion nerve uh, cells, on which the, the hair cells directly impact, we, we wanted to see whether this HCN2 ion channel is present there. And yes, it is indeed. Which, so we're, we're off, off the ground here in drawing an analogy with pain. And Alan Palmer's group have got a very nice way of detecting tinnitus in animals. Now, what's the point of working on animals? Well, because you can do experiments uh, that you can't do in humans on animals. You can test new drugs, for instance, that you think might alleviate tinnitus. Now, as I'm sure many of your listeners will know, exposure to loud sounds causes is one of the common causes of tinnitus in humans. And so it is with animals as well. If you expose a, a, a mouse, let's say, to or a guinea pig, uh, as, as they use in the Palmer lab, if you expose them to a continuous loud noise for an hour or so, uh, the animal will often get tinnitus. Now, the problem is, uh, as with all animal experiments, uh, a mouse or a guinea pig may be suffering from the most horrible tinnitus in the world, but they won't tell you. And how can you know if an animal is suffering from tinnitus? Well, there's a very cunning test, which I can explain it. I don't want to go into details, but I can explain it rather, rather quickly. If you have a continuous sound like that, followed by a sudden bang, the animal will startle. Okay, no surprise there. But if the is briefly interrupted, bang, like that, the gap before the bang warns the animal that the bang is coming and the startle is less. Okay, so far so good. What's that got to do with tinnitus? Well, if the animal has tinnitus, then the tinnitus will sort of fill in the gap. It will because it's a sound, uh, detected as a sound, it will prevent the animal from detecting the gap. And therefore, the animal jumps just as much as if the gap wasn't there. So this is called the gap detection test. So the uh, animal's hearing is interfered with in that it's not able to detect the brief gap in the noise. And this is, I have to say, I thought this was mind-blowingly clever when I first came across it from Alan Palmer's group. It's not just Alan's group that have done this, there have been a number of others, but uh, Alan's the person I've, I've worked with. So we have a test for tinnitus in animals. So my own group has de developed some rather selective blockers of this channel HCN2 that I was talking about before. And now we have a test and we found, sure enough, when we exposed our animals to loud sounds and created tinnitus, we found they had tinnitus using this test, and then we exposed them to one of our selective drugs, and guess what? The tinnitus disappeared as long as the drug was there. Of course, it came back as soon as the drug effects had worn off. So we were tremendously encouraged by this. And those specific drugs were targeting the peripheral hearing system, is that correct? They were. That was another big advantage. They were peripherally restricted, so they were not able to enter the brain. So we could be pretty sure that they were having a peripheral effect. And tell us more about this, because I remember in the last five to 10 years, even this had this was studied with particularly the perspective of uh, military veterans, loud noise exposure, drugs that would 
stay in the peripheral system and either be used temporarily to prevent exposure to hearing loss, exposure to loud noise, or trying to recover some of that short-term damage. So what's this, what's the state, the state of research on this subject? I'm not as a pain person, I'm not completely au fait with the latest research in this, to be honest. But as you say, I mean, it's it's a, a tremendous problem, particularly for military veterans who are exposed almost automatically to loud sounds as a result of their their uh, their, their, their life, life's work. But yes, uh, is there a drug that could prevent tinnitus? Well, I, I have to say uh, the sort of drug uh, that, that we were working on, and I have to say these are not available for general consumption. They were, were sort of developmental drugs, but you know who knows, maybe one day there may be. They don't last long. So you could take a drug, your tinnitus would disappear for maybe half a day or something like that, and then it would come back. So I'm not pretending that these drugs are a cure, but, you know, maybe if you take a drug in the morning and a drug in the evening and your tinnitus goes away as a result, perhaps that would be a, a, a big benefit for people who suffer from tinnitus. I hope. Yeah. Well, tell us more. Tell us some last points here on uh, what do you see moving forward here between your lab and other tinnitus focused projects that you're aware of? And then uh, right after that, we'd love to hear where we can follow your research. Well, I think that the first step in developing new treatments is going to be developing a better understanding of tinnitus. So am I right in saying that tinnitus is a peripheral phenomenon? I mean, I have some evidence to support that view or else I wouldn't be sitting here uh, uh, sort of giving it to you. But I've been wrong before in my scientific life and I could be wrong again. In fact, in my lab, uh, we don't have an actual banner, but I tell students who arrive in my lab uh, that you have to imagine over the door there is a big banner and the banner says there are no bad experiments, there are only bad hypotheses. So I've advanced a hypothesis, uh, which is that uh, tinnitus is a peripheral phenomenon, uh, that it's driven by these channels that I've told you about, ion channels, proteins in the membrane, which are called HCN2, and I could be wrong. I would be delighted to be wrong. I think it's a rather entertaining hypothesis and we have some evidence to support it, but I've been wrong before and I'll be wrong again. But it's a starting point uh, about taking what's perhaps a different approach to tinnitus from that of people in the field. Absolutely. Well, one thing that we know being audiologists helping tinnitus patients every day is that no one case of tinnitus is the same. And that there's a lot of, um, you know, there's mul it's multifactorial in, in why it is bothersome. And there are solutions, there are strategies to manage it and live a full and productive life. So that message of hope, and especially when it's based in evidence and research, is so important. And everyone needs to know that. Peter, where can we follow your research and your lab's work over time? Well, um, <laughs> I, I have a website, but it tends, it's a rather dry website. It's kind of a list of the papers that we've published and a little bit about my research. Every so often, well, it's, every time I get a chance, then I talk to popular outlets, newspapers, etc., about our research, which people are obviously interested in pain and in tinnitus, and they quite often approach me for this sort of quotes and things like that. But in terms of a, a place where you can go to every day and see how we're getting on, I, I actually don't have one. I'm sorry, and I should do. Oh, well, your website is plenty. All right, Peter McNaughton, thank you for sharing your expertise and your perspective. Uh, we'd love to catch up soon. And thanks again for being here. Thank you very much, Ben. Thank you for talking to me. Take care.